Tibet, an intriguing and mysterious land of snow, high up in the Himalayas, bordering Nepal, Bhutan and India. For centuries, this was a dream destination for scientists, adventurers and missionaries, once almost inaccessible, a blossoming yet hidden kingdom. Lhasa, the holy city and place of the gods. This is the capital of Tibet and also its largest city, a land that is now an autonomous region of China. This is a sacred road that travels around the Bakor Temple. It serves as both a market and gathering place for all kinds of vehicles. Some pilgrims kneel, lie down on the road or crawl part of the way. Their chest, stomach and knees are protected by leather. The surroundings of the Zhokang Temple are full of mystique and the amazing atmosphere of daily life in Lhasa. The omnipresent sacrifice stoves that are located along the ritual pathway give off a strong scent of juniper and a gentle breeze stirs the traditional prayer banners. The Baho Road extends for 800 meters around the Jokhang Temple and nearby Tsuklakhang Square. For the faithful, a visit to the Jokhang Temple is the highlight of a long and arduous pilgrimage. Finally, they are close to their longed for destination. Outside the temple's main entrance, there are large numbers of pilgrims. Thus, another entrance is made available. The Jokang Temple was originally built as a shrine for a special Buddha statue. In the 7th century, the statue was a valuable wedding gift from the Chinese Emperor to Princess Wen Zhen, who had it transported to Lhasa. The Jokang Temple derived its name from the Tibetan name of Buddha, Jobo. It is traditional for the faithful to visit the temple on certain days of the year. They often must wait for several hours outside the gates of the sanctuary. The Dalai Lama once sat in the inner courtyard during the monk's annual final examination. On the sanctuary's roof are several artistic figures, fabulous beings that have much significance. The monks' final examinations were also a splendid festive event, so the Jokang Temple contains much decoration. Even today, the temple is a national sanctuary and an active center of Buddhism. Without the monasteries, the development of Buddhism in Tibet would have been impossible. Some were built solely for women, such as the Ani Tsang Kung Monastery. Hidden in a tranquil side road of the old town is a nunnery in which women study sacred texts, partake in arts and crafts, and also do their washing. It's the same for the monks. They come to the monastery as early as eight years of age and grow up within the religious community. Despite their varying sizes and locations, each monastery has a similar layout that includes a sheltered courtyard, an altar and several rooms that contain the images of various deities. 
They cook for themselves in the monastery's kitchen. As in many other monasteries, a steep staircase leads up to an assembly hall. The Dukan is used for daily gatherings as well as religious ceremonies. The nuns pray here together and focus on the spiritual presence of the Dalai Lama. Daily life outside the monastery gates is beginning to conflict more and more with contemporary city life. This is ever more obvious. While new and generous roads are busy with buses and bicycle rickshaws, within the courtyards of the old town, women create sheepskin rugs manually. Despite the speedy modernization of this village that has grown into a city, it has managed to retain its timeless character. Picturesque inner courtyards are reminiscent of old picture books that feature the exotic world of the Tibet that was once almost totally unknown by the outside world. It contains many well-preserved wooden buildings from days gone by that are still in good condition due to the dry and cool mountain climate. Around seven kilometers west of Lhasa's city center, there are hordes of visitors, as this area contains the old summer residence of various former Dalai Lamas. The Norbulinka, the Garden of Gems, has been deserted since the end of the 1950s, because in 1959, the last Dalai Lama was forced into exile. Before a representative of the Chinese Emperor of the Qing Dynasty had a palace built here for the seventh Dalai Lama, there was once a willow grove. The palace was subsequently enlarged and named Nobulinka. However, the seventh Dalai Lama never lived in this summer residence. It became the home of the eighth Dalai Lama. Over the years, the large Nobulinka complex had further buildings added during the reign of various Tibetan monarchs. Yet the colorful blossom cannot obscure the sad history of this beautifully located summer residence. The splendid Nobulinka rightly deserves its name. The Dalai Lama's summer residence and its spacious parks are veritable treasures. In the north of the old town is another important temple, Ramoche. Built in the seventh century and destroyed several times by fire, it was, however, lovingly rebuilt. This ancient place of culture contains an academy of the esoteric Gelukpa set, as well as a higher Tantra institution that teaches Buddhist texts to the monks. The old monastery building once stored a statue that was brought to Tibet by the Nepalese wife of King Songtsen Gampo. During the Cultural Revolution, its interior decoration was pillaged and the temples used as both a school and living quarters. Today, it is once again an important sanctuary. Now more than 50 monks live here. It's also a pilgrimage destination. From the roof, the Botala Mountain Palace can be seen in all its glory. It's plain to see how this city has become a center of religion. A 
new building of traditional design, the Tibet Museum, features numerous works of art from various epochs, from prehistory right up until the time of the monarchy. The history of Lhasa began in the 7th century when the 33rd Tibetan king Songsen Gampo relocated here from the Yalong Valley. Even then, man had a good understanding of the world. Medicine, astronomy and art had developed to a high level. The king had his palace built on the Mapori, the hill on which the Potala was constructed. The first royal city was surrounded by a high wall. Chinese immigrants introduced their culture to this remote mountain world, including the traditional evening market that is now very much a part of everyday life here. The Tianhai Evening Market is situated in a large hall that contains several corridors. The various shops are packed in quite tightly and they boast a large variety of goods. There are also several restaurants in which all kinds of food is freshly prepared, a true feast for the senses. Ten kilometers west of Lhasa is one of the most important monasteries in Tibet. A pilgrim trail leads up to Dripungongba that was built in 1416 by a scholar of Chongkapa, who was the founder of the Gilog Order. The Gilog Academy is the earliest of the four main doctrines of Tibetan Buddhism. The followers of this order are also known as Yellow Caps. Along with the Sera and Ganden monasteries, the Dripang Monastery complex forms the three pillars of the state. In addition to religion, many other subjects were also taught here. Because the abbots of Dripong were heavily involved in politics, the monastery was often attacked. Much of the monastery complex was destroyed by the Mongol armies of the Dzungaris and the Koshok tribes. In the first part of the 17th century, while under the rule of the 5th Dalai Lama, Drepung was again enlarged. Many important spiritual leaders studied at one of its four faculties. The political influence of the abbots remained intact until the Cultural Revolution. And now the important monastery complex of Drepongomba looks as good and divine as ever. Opposite Potala and nestling on a rock wall is a small and ancient cave sanctuary, the Palupuk Temple. Steep steps lead up to the first level of the temple that was once used to calm down various rock and water deities who were disturbed by the construction of the Jokang. As is customary, here the deities of long life are worshipped in glass display cabinets. Early Nepalese artists created them. The steps lead to further corridors that have been carved into the rock, to painted caves in which the various deities are worshipped. The pilgrims are mesmerized by the colorful sacred paintings. The Lhasa River is one of the tributaries of Yalong's Zangbo River. It flows through both the city and the colorful High Valley. In the seventh month of the Tibetan calendar, the Tibetans bathe here and wash their laundry. 
It's believed that the water has a healing effect. And the courageous throw themselves into the water of happiness. Around 60 kilometers east of Lhasa, amid the untouched mountain world of the Kichu Valley, is the town of Dagzi that contains one of Tibet's most famous monasteries. Ganden Gomba was once a flourishing monastery town. However, this much revered Tibetan landmark was destroyed during the Cultural Revolution. Prior to the annexation of Tibet by China, this temple town was for centuries a religious center of the Yellow Caps Academy. Until 1959, 3,000 monks inhabited the Ganden Monastery complex. At that time, it truly lived up to its name, meaning full of joy. It's believed that the founder of the monastery and father of the Gelug Academy, John Kapa, once taught his pupils in one of its halls. John Kapa chose this site for the construction of his monastery in 1409. His various reforms were realized here in Ganden. Jongkapa's tomb, the most holy place in the complex, has a unique atmosphere, mysterious and highly spiritual. The local people are ardent believers. China made it possible, a train journey to the roof of the world, the Qinghai Express, that travels from Peking to Lhasa. Everything here is huge, the square plus the train station and its platforms. This new railroad is one of the most ambitious projects of the People's Republic of China. 1120 kilometers of railway track, 286 bridges and the highest located train station in the world. Custom-built pressurized wagons guarantee a necessary supply of oxygen. Tibet will derive much benefit from this railroad, even though almost half the route travels through permafrost regions that are earthquake-prone. A special cultural highlight is the show theater Happiness on the Way with its review of the same name. Here, age-old traditions are performed. In the style of a Las Vegas show, Tibet's mystical history is performed with splendid costumes, acrobatics and exotic music. Well-built men perform the laborious work of the farmers in their fields, and the stage setting changes into the various seasons of the year. A long journey always leads to the gate of happiness. Now it's harvest time. The people are grateful. Finally, they're able to harvest what they've sowed. All their hard work has reached fruition. Growing harmony and contentment fill the scene. With each new stage set, happiness increases. A group of musicians joins the actors, and the harvest is celebrated with song and dance. The artists are ecstatic, while others dance frenetically on the huge stage, strikingly dressed in white goatskin. They come to their final destination, meditating Tibetan monks await their arrival, and move together in perfect harmony in front of a huge painting of Buddha.
But now, back to reality. On the other side of the Chakpuri, a small mountain opposite Potala, is the seldom visited Sangya Tongku Temple. Hidden away and therefore off the tourist trail, this temple of a thousand images of God is nevertheless very popular among faithful Buddhists. It is a place of silent prayer. Outside the main temple that has a facade of painted rock, it's not far to a stupa whose walls contain various illustrated plates. The illustrations depict Buddha in various religious poses. The outer pilgrim's route around Lhasa leads past this temple, hidden away from the hectic life of the city. In the environs of the city, three large monasteries were once important centers for the yellow cap sect, Tripung, Ganden and Sera. In 1417, the construction of the monastery began. Jamchen Choje, a pupil of Tsongkhapa, chose this place that also had a number of hermit's caves. In former times, Tibet's Sheridan Temple stood here, a place in which monk soldiers and guards were educated. The monks of Serra were well known for their quick thinking, and the discussion garden is still used for emotional arguments that are accompanied by enthusiastic clapping. More than 5,000 monks once lived here. Today, there are around 200. And the three academies still enjoy an excellent reputation. However, as many demonstrations for Tibet's independence begin here, a visit to the monastery can sometimes be a little risky. The Botala towers up mighty and timeless, one of the most extraordinary places in Asia. Long before the Dalai Lamas, this palace mountain and its close surroundings served as the location for the residences of Tibet's monarchy. There was subsequently a manifestation of the new power of the Yellow Academy that has, right up until the present day, lost nothing of its importance as a highly religious location. The Potala Palace is one of the most important destinations for the many pilgrims who come to Mapori Mountain each day. The architecture of the red and white palaces dates back to the 17th century, to the time of the fifth Dalai Lama. Potala is a symbol of the political and spiritual power that the Dalai Lamas have possessed throughout the centuries on this religious state. The incarnated living gods whose successors were the reincarnation of the same soul. In 1578, the Mongol Emperor Altan Khan gave the Tibetan vice regent the title Dalai Lama, that means Ocean of Wisdom. Each of the subsequent 14 religious leaders have retained this title. The Yellow Academy knew how to establish itself. The believers of other doctrines were forced to convert or flee. However, since 1720, the Chinese Empire began to make its own demands on Tibet. Lhasa, a city of gods on the roof of the world, is undoubtedly one of the last mysterious locations on Earth.